Well, it's good to be back, and uh, John and Linda, thank you again for coming all this way. John from the East, <laughs> Linda from the West, and we meet in the Middle East. Uh, you know, the amazing thing is, three years ago we met in person to talk about the development of this roadmap. None of us expected anything like COVID, and if anything, COVID <laughs> accelerated the need and the thinking around this global roadmap. Most of the mortality and death and disease that resulted from COVID affected the elderly much more so than young people. And so we think about the pandemic and we think about aging, we think of them in two different conversations sometimes. And yet, some countries were better prepared, others were not, we learned a lot. I hate to remind us, but the National Academy, of course, predicted a pandemic 10 years before it happened, and unfortunately, we didn't do anything of any significance to change that. We're now at a moment in history where we've now got a roadmap on aging. We've talked about it this morning. Both of you um, co-chaired this initiative. What about the roadmap that you talked about this morning can we take and learn from as it applies to the Gulf countries, to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In particular, we get this question, well, you know, 50% of the population is under age 25, and maybe 2 or 3% of the population is over 65, so why are we talking about aging in the Kingdom? So maybe I'll start with you, John. Uh, you have all this experience from Singapore, and then uh, Linda uh, from yourself. But well, um, thank you very much, Mehmood. And, uh, um, Your Highness uh, and, and members of the audience. Um, I, I think that if there was one message that um, personally I would like to share, and I, I, I believe most that the Commission feels the same, is that the issue is, we saw the graphs, there is an inexorable shift in society uh, whereby thanks to advances in health and science, people are living longer. But because of the huge social transformations, families are getting smaller. And we are now, we have passed that tipping point where now there are more people over 65 than under five. And it's gonna happen everywhere, as Memodu said in those brilliant opening remarks. So it's never too early. It's never too early to start to ask ourselves, how do we prepare to remain robust societies because the issues that need to be addressed cover every fabric of society. This is, as the United Nations has said in 2017, arguably one of the biggest social transformations of the 21st century. And, and it will touch every part of society. So we, all societies need to ask ourselves, how do we ensure that our own societies, and then the global village remains robust for not only now, but for the future, for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. So Linda, you've been thinking about the medicine of aging and all facets of this roadmap for most of your career. Mm -hmm. In fact, last time you talked, ever since you were a resident, from your postdoctoral days, mm -hmm. We've come a long way. If you would had the opportunity, as you have today, to talk about two regional leaders, regional policymakers, what, what have we learned from North America, from Europe and Asia? What are the do's and what are the don'ts? Mahmoud, thank you, and it's an honor to be here um, with all of you, Your Highness. Um, I, I would start with where you started, Mahmoud, around our experience in a global pandemic of COVID, where you pointed out that timing is everything. Uh, warnings 10 years ago, readiness or not, determined fate. But um, I think similarly, demographically young countries are in a, a fabulous position to to use the science, to use the knowledge, to use our ability now with science to, to predict what's coming and to see what the assets and opportunities are. 
and to prepare. By the time societies transform, the young people who are 30 will be 50 and 60. And so these transformations are really for the sake of a young society growing older in a way that they would value, as well as how society will thrive. If you think about another dimension of the COVID pandemic, one, well, there are two maybe to bring up. One is that most deaths were in older adults, but the people who got seriously ill were the people who were frail, for sure, or people with chronic diseases who were the most at risk in general. And how we recognize that an increasingly, uh, a, even young populations increasingly burdened with non what we call non-communicable diseases puts young and middle-aged people at risk um, of a pandemic, but it also sets them up to age with ill health, not with good health. And so the discussions this morning among, across many panels about the need to rebalance our investments in prevention um, complemented by the right balance of investments in treatment is a really critical transition for nations. The last example I would give from, you, from your COVID metaphor is that what we saw globally in, in many parts of the world was a blaming of old people uh, for, for um, economic problems. Now, I think the facts of that don't support the, the blame that was going on. It's very clear that age and health and wealth are not separable, but that the solutions were not in blaming old people or sequestering them. Similarly, um, I think the <laughs> obstacles for all of us are not just ageism, but many of the myths and fears that have been debunked by science. One very important one, which I mentioned this morning, is that we think that if older people, as we get older, are continuing to stay engaged in society, whether it's working or volunteering, that somehow that will displace or block opportunities for young people. And in fact, the evidence is exactly the opposite. It will open up jobs for young people. It will open up opportunities. So let me pick up from there. You have a, a, a whole new young generation of physicians, scientists, entrepreneurs, basic and applied science, architects, engineers. You heard mm -hmm. this morning from the engineering discussion of how to even think about city design, mm. and that raises two broad questions. New career paths. Mm. These are careers and, and disciplines we haven't even considered yet, but it's going to open that up. And so what advice would you give to the scientists and physicians and actually related to the entrepreneurs to think about now? to invest for the future. And then, John, I'd like you to think, and I'll come to you with that. And the second is, jobs might get changed. I mean, Singapore's been at the forefront of adopting technology. How do we see the adoption of technology to enable this roadmap to happen? Mm -hmm. So, if you could just get careers, so, uh, science. I've got a lot of young physicians who are looking at your esteemed career. By the way, for my audience, somebody was, came up to me and said, oh, I want to meet Dr. Linda Fried. She's a legend. I said, well, let me introduce you to the legend. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I would say that the more I've been in this field, the more excited I get that how we design, we've created longevity, but we ha what we haven't done is design a society for the longer lives we created design the opportunity for health. I, I have begun to think about this as the design opportunity mm -hmm. of the 21st century, which will mm -hmm. probably require many grand acts of imagination um, uh, to really shape something that is human-centered and planet-viable, but, but 
really is based on innovation and the imagination of, uh, of what could be, harnessing the opportunities that, that longer lives could offer us. And out of that is going to come jobs we probably never imagined, um, a longevity economy based on both more older people working longer, which puts more wealth into a nation, but also creates more jobs for the young and uh, more opportunity f uh, for older people to contribute as consumers. The, the other thing is, I think one of the things we've never imagined is what jobs could be for all of us as we get older that would harness the capabilities that we accrue as we get older. Most jobs in the world, except maybe in the tech sector, were designed when life expectancy was 45. What, what would the jobs be that would utilize the capabilities and assets of older minds and spirits? Thank you. John, Singapore is always considered, as I said, at the forefront of, in many technology adoptions, from design to municipalities to the consumer. How can technology, from what you've seen, be leveraged to actually help implement what the recommendations of this roadmap, to accelerate it? So, so the technology, I would uh, say, is uh, an incredible force multiplier. Um, and uh, I would just perhaps use the analogy, and I would just perhaps use the analogy of the smartphone or the iPhone. Um, it never really existed 15 years ago. Uh, it used to be a brick. Yeah, we're both old enough to remember that. <laughs> yes, but you think about what it can do from besides taking pictures, it can, you don't need, you can help navigate any city, um, you can order food, you can make payments, uh, um, uh, you can search nearly anything under the sun, you can watch movies. So one piece of technology has opened innumerable doors. It created the whole um, ride hailing uh, uh, um, uh, industry um, which created lots of jobs, especially for older people. Uh, um, you know, the gig economy is not just for younger people, but also for older people. So one key issue which has come up in technology is the importance of co-design. Because brilliant technology fails if the user interface is not considered. If the user interface is baked in from the start, there's a much greater chance of adoption. And in Singapore, the two key words that we are using for technology right now is adoption and sustainability. Because you can have the best hammer, but if no person picks up the hammer, it's raised lying on the, on the shelf. And it has to be sustainable. And in, certainly in Singapore, sustainability ultimately the state is a big force in sustainability. So it must meet the specifications and be able to be sustainable, either by the private sector or by the consumer or by the state or all three. And so I would posit to um, the, the, the entire audience, not just for the younger members of the audience, but to everyone, um, the opportunities. We should really look at we should really be looking at an older age not as an impediment, but as an incredible opportunity for, in a way, new adventures. It's a new adventure for all of us, but we can only benefit from this new adventure if we are healthy, and then if we are educated, and we can, if, if we can shape this together. So the Academy, under your leadership, back in August, launched the roadmap in Singapore. In fact, it was the first uh, place to launch um, the roadmap. We're now four or five, no, six months out from that. What concrete steps have you seen that might have changed minds since the roadmap was launched six months ago? And what can we learn sitting here in GCC from your last six months of experience from that point? 
Well, firstly, let me say, remember, you were a key member of the commission. So it was leadership by everyone, including by Victor, uh, to start us all down this pathway. Um, I can say that I'm very grateful to the National Academy because um, when we launched the report in Singapore, the Deputy Prime Minister, who is also the coordinating minister for, so, for, um, for uh, economic policy, um, uh, Mr. Heng Sui Kiat, um, stayed the whole morning and was so energized by what he heard, I'm told that when he went back to the office, he convened an uh, impromptu meeting of several other cabinet ministers who basically asked me, what did you say? Because we all called out of meetings. But I would probably say in the, in the six months or so, there is a reframing of the issue from one of worry, of that's still very much the case, there is that concern about how do we, um, how do we ensure that we are not subsumed by, by the demographics, but then how do we seize the opportunities? And the roadmap was, in my mind, a very powerful manual of what to do. Um, we heard, I mean, everyone knows why we need to do this. The, man, the roadmap now gives us evidence, over 220 pages with 19 commissioners and the whole power of the U.S. Academy uh, to be able to say this is an operating manual at least for the next five years, if not beyond. And now what we need to do is each society then needs to contextualize this and say, what does this mean in our own society in how to do it? Because there'll be many paths to Riyadh, but I think that what we all need to do is we need to start on this and really try and make sure this co-design is critical. It cannot be led by the universities. The government is critical, but the government alone can't do it. It requires a whole of society effort, and I'm very excited about that. Thank you. So my final question, Linda, as you think about our work, both here in the region, but also for the benefit of all, as we partner with different institutions, connect different institutions, what parts of the roadmap and the opportunity that Evolution has to help accelerate this? What can we do at Evolution to actually accelerate the implementation of this roadmap? I think your role can be critical. Um, you're dedicated to the science that needs to drive the accelerate, not just the launch, but the acceleration of our ability to meet the roadmap goals. That science has to do with the biology of how we actually drive the opportunity for increased health across longer lives, many dimensions of that biology. That's going to be very important. A lot of that is then going to inform how we balance toward prevention of disease, promotion of health across the lifespan, and then link to the changes that we need in every sector of society using the science. Thank you. Well, in closing, just for my audience, I'd like to mention that uh, while both are great examples of healthy lifestyle and living, I, t I told both of them at lunchtime today, that for the two days they're here, they have to try everything Saudi, and especially Omali, <laughs> because that may be the secret ingredient in healthy longevity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.